Welcome to Total Spectrum Spotlight, an informative look and an insightful discussion of today's legislative issues and political trends. Hi, I'm Congressman Eric Paulson, and welcome to this week's Spotlight. We are fortunate today to have Jay Timmons, who is the president and CEO of the National Association of Manufacturers, which of course represents large and small manufacturers in every industrial sector with us today. Jay, thank you so much for taking some time with us. It is great to be here, Eric. It's good to be talking with you again. Well, let me ask you this. Um, look, you've had a long tenure in the manufacturing sector and you know, give us a perspective. How would you describe the manufacturing sector outlook today? Is, is it optimistic? Is it pessimistic? So I don't think, um, I don't think anybody could have prepared regardless of how long their tenure might be for, for the last uh, year and a half or so. But I have to say, Eric, today, manufacturers are really overwhelmingly optimistic in fact, I think they're more optimistic now than they were right before the pandemic. Uh, we do a survey every year of our, of our member companies. And in the first quarter, 87.6% of manufacturers felt positive about their company's outlook. Um, that again was according to our NAM Manufacturers Outlook Survey. That is the best outlook since the first quarter of 2019. And I anticipate that that optimism is gonna to continue to rise through this quarter and well beyond as vaccines continue to save lives and as demand surpasses pre-pandemic levels, which we're seeing. Well, it's a really positive outlook for the future. Um, what about the workforce? Uh, you know, we do hear from manufacturers, of course, that they're always looking to attract more job seekers in the industry these days. Right. Is there a real need now for workers? Is it more pronounced as the economy is recovering out of the pandemic? What you know from your service in Congress, that that was a prime issue for almost all employers, especially manufacturers. But today, that, that issue and that concern is exponentially larger because today we have 851,000 open jobs in manufacturing. That is an all-time record. And over the next decade, we're going to need to fill 4 million jobs. That's according to research from Deloitte and the Manufacturing Institute. Um, the Manufacturing Institute is our workforce development and education partner. But here's the key number. 2.1 million of those jobs could go unfilled if we don't inspire a new generation to pursue manufacturing careers. And that's why we launched an unprecedented nationwide campaign that we call Creators Wanted. And it connects emerging and displaced workers with higher paying careers in modern manufacturing. We're going to go state by state to inspire more people to join our industry. Wow, 2.1 million. That, that's, that, that's a big number to hit, <laughs> no doubt. Well, we should really pivot to Capitol Hill and some of the discussions going on there. Of course, the president now and Congress are negotiating a potential major infrastructure package. We know that NAM does support improved national infrastructure, of course, across the country. You know, you've cited your concern about the proposed financing mechanism, which could be an increase in the corporate income tax, but, but why is that of a concern to the manufacturing community? So that's a great question. And I think a lot of people assume, and it's a, it's a valid assumption, most people just don't want to be taxed more, right? We don't want to have to pay more, whether that's an individual or a business. But that's not the, the prime reason behind our opposition to increases in taxes on businesses. Because it's true that tax reform was rocket fuel for manufacturers. And going back to the archaic tax policies of the past, quite simply would be destructive. The NAM has worked with respected economists to analyze the potential effects of the tax increases that are now under consideration. And we found that the tax hikes would be disastrous for jobs. They'd, they'd be terrible for wage growth and innovation. Across the economy, we would lose 1 million jobs within just two years of implementation and about 500,000 to 600,000 per year over the following decades. That's five to six million more jobs lost. Now, manufacturers have outlined funding alternatives for infrastructure that don't require new taxes, including public-private partnerships. We know that there's trillions of dollars in the private sector just waiting to be invested on, on good projects like, like infrastructure. We've talked about user fees and bonds and a national infrastructure bank. And there are many options and we can raise the funds without increasing the burden on the women and men who make things in America. Uh, we do have a publication that I think is uh, worth pointing out because it outlines all of this. It's the NAM's Building to Win 
infrastructure blueprint, and that's available at nam.org slash building to win. It's really amazing when you look at how many jobs we created after tax reform and, and the record amount of investment and the record wage growth that we saw. So that was what really propelled us forward. We don't want to go back. And our future really depends as well as you indicated and why we're so supportive on historic infrastructure investment. We have to be able to compete with the rest of the world. And for those who are watching this, if they want to help in our push for historic infrastructure investment funded without tax hikes, they can simply text build to win the number two build to win to five two eight eight six that's five two eight eight six so bottom line is let's move forward by investing in infrastructure but let's do it without taking two steps backwards with tax increases well and as you point out you know with the tax reforms that put us on that trajectory of increased economic growth it's great to hear that NAM is is identifying other sources of funding that should be looked at. And as negotiations continue on Hap Capitol Hill, we hope, of course, that that'll be in the mix. In the well, mix. I have to tell you, it, it makes no sense to simply oppose something. When you were in Congress, I'm sure it was very frustrating for you. I'm sure a lot of people opposed things, um, but couldn't tell you they might have they might have supported the ultimate goal, but they couldn't tell you how they might want to get there in a different way. We've been very consistent for the last several years with our building to win proposal that there are many options for funding infrastructure. We just don't want to, we don't want to harm our ability to create and generate new jobs in the process. You know, uh, since we were just hitting on taxes a little bit, you know, has your team at NAM, have they had a chance to consider any of the pros and cons potentially of the, the new G7 agreement that assesses a minimum 15% tax on global corporations? Well, there's some irony in there. Um, you know, to see our current administration supporting a 15% global tax, yet calling for an additional 10 to 13% on top of that for domestic businesses here in the United States. Higher taxes on US businesses simply make this less competitive, and it hurts our ability to attract investment and foster job creation and wage growth. As for a global tax, so far, Frankly, we're seeing more questions than answers. 15% tax on what? How do you calculate it? None of that, unfortunately, is clear yet. After the G7, it has to go to the G20. Then all of the OECD countries, will China support it? It remains unclear as to whether they will. So if you're gonna have one holdout like that, well, they're gonna end up being the winner. And how do you have a level playing field at that point? So right now, there's still a good deal of questions about what this will mean in practice, but the bottom line is this. Our focus at the NAM is making sure America stays competitive and manufacturers in the United States are the ones that are going to win the, 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 global comp the war for global competition. Great. Um, you know, the Wall Street Journal recently had an article calling uh, Southwest United States area America's new factory hub. You know, our friends at the Arizona Chamber and the Arizona Manufacturers Council are a state affiliate for NAM there, and they're cheering some of these major investments by semiconductor makers and automakers and, and others. Um, what are you seeing in states like Arizona and Texas that might make them more competitive than traditional manufacturing strongholds we all think of in the past? Well, I've always been bullish about manufacturing in the Southwest. Um, our last state of manufacturing tour, when we actually could do those things in person, <laughs> was um, uh, ran through Arizona, as a matter of fact. I think a reason manufacturing has such a powerful presence there is because Arizona, Texas, neighboring states, they've really focused on building a welcoming environment for business. In particular, a focus on competitive tax environment, on education, workforce development incentives to invest and hire. All of that is helping to differentiate the Southwest and bring jobs and business. So these policies, I, I think, have helped Arizona, for example, become a major hub for semiconductor production. And that success really builds upon itself. Companies want to be close to where chips are made, which helps explain why we're also seeing a burgeoning electric vehicle presence there in the state. There's many states that could learn from that example, and we'd like to see our country overall replicate some of these policies at the federal level to help have the same effect for the United States 
in the global economy. You know, you mentioned several policy issues that are focused on helping the manufacturing sector thrive and, and compete across the, the world. You know, the Arizona business community, like many employer groups across the country, is also very concerned about another policy issue being discussed called the PRO Act and its potential effect on Arizona's right to work status and the workplace environment generally. As you know, there's a lot of pressure on the Arizona congressional delegation to support that legislation. What, what are manufacturers saying about the PRO Act that, that you hear? Well, look, just to just to set the stage, manufacturers fully support fully support employees' right to collective bargaining. But unfortunately, the PRO Act, it's quite simply a very anti-worker proposal. Its provisions would take away the worker's right to a secret ballot and to choose whether to pay union dues, for instance. It would open them up to intimidation and coercion and unionization elections, and it would essentially ban employers from talking to their employees without the presence of a union representative. We see these types of changes as really chilling the relationship between employers and their teams. Around 97% of manufacturers, in fact, say that the PRO Act will have a negative impact on business operations and on their relations with employees. That's according to the NAM's uh, Manufacturers Outlook Survey. We, we are very proud, very proud of the relationship that manufacturers have with those who are in our workforce. And we don't want anything to stand in the way of that, of that culture, of that, of that productive relationship. And the uncertainty that this legislation is threatening to inject could curtail a lot of that record level optimism and growth that we just discussed. So needless to say, Eric, we're working hard to make sure that that, that particular piece of legislation does not become law. And by the way, if there are true problems that exist Again, we'd like to hear those and we'd like to be able to address those head on. Quite frankly, we haven't heard those problems. We've had 70 years of labor law that has worked perfectly fine and we don't think that we need to take a step backwards. Well, Jay, this has been a great conversation. I know folks across the country have been particularly tuned into the manufacturing sector in the wake of the pandemic and how the sector has really had to step up in some challenging supply chain issue times. And uh, of course, we wish you the best in the future and thank you for your time uh, with us today. Well, thank you for allowing me to be here. And I, I, I have to say, uh, I couldn't be more proud of the manufacturing sector and, to, and all the work that they did throughout the pandemic and locating PPE and distributing it, um, being responsible for a vaccine that is literally saving the world. Our manufacturers have, have really stepped up in the United States. And uh, because of that, I think we're gonna have a much brighter future. I really do appreciate being able to be here with you today, Eric, and, and being able to say hello to all of our friends uh, in the business community. Thank you for watching Total Spectrum Spotlight. For more information about Total Spectrum, please visit us at totalspectrumsga.com. Total Spectrum, strategies uniquely focused on your success.